Welcome to this video on registration. My name is Mark Jenkinson and I'm going to talk to you about some of the practical applications that we use registration in and particularly about single stage and multi-stage registration pipelines. We have two main tools within FSL to do registration which we've briefly discussed before in other videos. Nonlinear tool called FNIRT and a linear tool called FLIRT. These have their own GUIs associated with them, but actually registration is embedded in every kind of analysis that we do. And so often it occurs as a tab within one of the bigger tools, such as feet that you can see on the bottom left here, there's a registration tab, and also in the diffusion tools, there's a registration component. And in all of these, there are various different parameters that you have to set, such as the spatial transformation that you want to do. So it's quite common that you'll see different registration choices pop up even within these big tools, often with defaults, and they're often very good defaults that you don't need to change, but you need to think about it, particularly if you're doing anything which is slightly unusual. Before we do registration, before we use some of these uh, larger tools and, and pipelines, there are some recommended steps that we would always say should be run. One of them is to reorient your images. So here we have a tool called FSL Reorient to Standard, and what that does is it simply takes your original image, which you, which might be like you're seeing here, where the slices have been determined by the person who controlled the acquisition and they've been taken in a certain way. And all it's going to do is it's going to reorder the different axes, it's not going to change the quality of the image at all. And it's simply going to make it so it's in the standard configuration because for instance, here we're used to seeing our coronal in this plane, as opposed to our coronal sort of funnily on the side here. So that's just going to make things like the registration jobs easier because it's going to start in a fairly standard orientation. We also recommend doing brain extraction, which we talked about before. And another thing that can be useful is to do bias field correction, particularly if it's, you've got noticeable strong bias field within your images. If it's a moderate bias field, then generally the tools work fine without having to do that explicitly, but it certainly is useful if you are seeing any prominent bias fields within your images. Note that when you're doing the orientation, and in fact, whenever you get images off the scanner, you should always check that the labels are correct. So the labels are these sort of L, R, S, I, A, P for left, right, anterior, posterior, inferior, superior, and they should be attached to the appropriate part of the anatomy. You won't necessarily be able to tell whether it's left or right, but you can certainly tell whether the superior is at the top of the head, whether anterior is at the front of the head and so forth. If any of those labels are at the inappropriate locations within the image, stop and go and fix that at the reconstruction stage. There's something has gone wrong from your scanner to get it into the nifty format. And that needs to be fixed before you do anything else because it's not good to continue with anything where the labels are incorrect. So make sure you check that first. Okay, what I'll talk about now is single stage registration. And that's a particular scenario where we have two different images and they're from the same subject. So this is a scenario we're gonna talk about here. And one of them is T1 weighted image, one of them is T2 weighted image. And so we need to think about how we set up the registration to solve this problem and particularly how we make the choices of the different options that we discussed previously. So we want to have our two images, they're different modalities, we want to register them together, they're from the same subject. So from that, we can automatically figure out what we should do. Same subject means it's within subject, so it should be a rigid body, because that subject has simply been able to rotate and translate their head. That should be the only difference in the geometry because it's the same anatomy. Because it's T2 weighted and T1 weighted, it's multimodal. So we need to use a multimodal cost function. The correlation ratio would be fine, but the two at the top of the table that we saw before, the two in red, least squares, normalized correlation, they are not okay. So it already restricts us what we can do. But correlation ratio or mutual information would be totally fine to use as a cost function in this case, because they can both cope with different modalities, different MRI modalities. We also would run brain extraction on both of the images. So we've got an input image and a reference image here. We want to run the brain extraction on both 
always make sure that you're registering two images, both of which are brain extracted or which neither is brain extracted. You never want to be in a situation where one is brain extracted and one is not because the registration will not be happy with that because there's a very big difference in that case and it won't be able to figure that out. And then we actually are going to have a difference between our input image and our reference image. They'll be treated slightly differently. The reference image will not be moved. The input image is the one which will be transformed to match the reference image. And our registrations tend to go better, the actual calculation of the registration, if we use the image which has better resolution or contrast as the reference image. If you can't tell, which is the case here, they both look good, then it doesn't matter. But if one has clearly worse resolution or worse contrast, that's better to be the input image rather than the reference image. And then the other thing is that you always need to check your output. And for checking output, we recommend a particular artifaction detection device, which is free, intuitive, and very widely available. And that is this. Just look at it. Look at the data just with your eyes. That's all you need to do, because actually the human visual system is fantastic for picking up lots of different things which are, are going on. So you don't need to be any world expert in anatomy to do this. The kind of things which go wrong are obvious to everybody. So that's just something that I always strongly recommend. Make sure that you look at both the data that we get off the scanner, but also the outputs of the various stages of your analysis. And for registration, that's particularly important because although we try, it doesn't always work. We cannot guarantee that, that any of the analysis things are going to work 100% of the time. So you need to check. And doing a visual check can be done in several different ways. One of them is to use viewers such as fossilized or cell view and flick between different images or overlay them one on top of each other. And I use that a lot. That's the, probably the most powerful way and the best way to sort of check everything within an image. But often there are even quicker ways that you can do it, which are perfectly acceptable and very good if you've got lots and lots of images to check through. So one of them is to get a static view. There's a little tool that we have within FCL called Slices, which you can use like this to get one. But this is also the same thing which you're going to be presented with as web page outputs from various tools that we have, such as Feet, our main fMRI analysis tool. And they look like this. So you've already seen a few examples where I've shown red edges from images. What we're seeing here is red edges from one of the images, the reference image, and the gray scale of the other image, the input image that's been realigned. So the input image has been transformed to match the reference image. And that's what we're getting. Red edges from one of them, the gray scale image from the other. So the red edges should align nicely with the boundaries that we see in the grayscale image, which is true here. We can also see that there's a lot of red in that mid-sagittal plane. That just represents that there's an edge between one hemisphere and the other hemisphere in most locations. That's fine, that's normal, there's nothing to worry about. It means that you can't really see the details of the grayscale image under that part, but there's still lots of useful information in that sagittal. You can still see the outline of the brainstem very clearly, the corpus callosum. That's very useful information, as well as the outer part of the brain. You'll also see that there are some edges present which don't have corresponding things within the grayscale image, and that's fine. It's going to find a few extraneous images because the brain extraction might be different or the contrast might be different in one of the images to the other, and it will pick up on details in one of them that are just not present in the other one. So you need to just hone in on the most important anatomical details and things which are outside of the brain largely ignore. So as I said, grayscale is coming from image one, red edges are coming from image two. When it's not aligned well, then quite often it's something like you can see in the bottom line there. It's very obvious. You don't need to be any expert to see that that's not worked very well because the red edge clearly doesn't match with the edge of the grayscale image, particularly at areas such as the front of the brain here in this axial, also very clear in the sagittal. You can see that the brainstem outline is not very good here. It's less obvious in the coronal. And that's something to keep in mind, is that it's really good to look at all of the three different orthogonal slices. Because sometimes one of them won't be very obvious. It's still not great. And if you look at it for any reasonable length of time, you can see things which are not good there. 
but it doesn't stand out in the way that the others do. So it's really good to always check the different planes. In terms of specifically using registration within FSL, then as I said before, we are going to treat the input and the reference image differently. The reference image is the one which stays fixed, and that actually controls the field of view and the resolution of the output image. So when you have the transformed input image, you will see that it ends up as the same size and the same resolution as your reference image, so that they can be easily overlaid on one another. The transformations are always given from the input space to the reference space. We can easily get inverse transforms which go the other way around. So that's fine. If you didn't want your input image to be transformed into the reference space, that's fine. It still can be useful to perform the registration this way around, particularly if the reference image has better resolution or contrast, but then just invert your transform later on and apply it to the reference image to, to transform it into the input space. It's easy to do. We can move things easily between various different spaces. We can overlay images with fossilized which have different field of view or resolutions. If you're still using FSL view, that's not true. But as I said, the native output is always going to be in the reference image space with the same field of view and resolution as the reference. And we can resample any image into a different space as long as we've got the transform and we can easily calculate an inverse transform if you've only got it in one direction. Okay, so that's single stage registration. Now what about multi-stage registration? We use multi-stage registration in various different scenarios. The most common one is this, where we're doing a function or maybe it's a diffusion study. We've got a particular modality which we've acquired with EPI, so that's either our functional or our diffusion imaging. And then we've also got a T1 weighted structural scan of that particular subject. And we would also need to get things into standard space. And so because of that, we've now got three different spaces and we will do multi-stage registration, both so that we can move between any combination of spaces that we want, but also because it gives us a better registration. And I'll explain why. So the two-stage registration is useful because actually a registration which has to deal with differences will find it more difficult depending on how many differences there are to deal with. So challenges to registration include differences in the individual anatomies, differences in the contrasts that you would get between different tissues as you see in different modalities, and distortions which might occur differently in one image by comparison with another. If we try and register an EPI directly to the standard space template, then we have all of these things because we it's a different anatomy because it's the standard template, which is an average anatomy and one person's individual anatomy. It's also got a different contrast because the EPI was acquired with the functional contrast. So it looks different, which you can just see on the bottom left there is a bright CSF and ventricles, for instance, and very little gray-white contrast, as opposed to the T1 scans, which have great gray-white contrast. And also there are distortions in the EPI, which are not present in the standard space images, the standard space templates. And so we're better off if we can do individual stages. Each of those stages is easier then. And so, for instance, here's one stage which we've got at the bottom. We've got the EPI image, so let's say it's the functional image, of one individual to the T1 weighted image of that same individual. Because it's a within subject problem, then actually I can do a six degree of freedom transformation, a rigid body. That's the appropriate thing to do. That means it's a linear registration. I can use my multimodal cost functions, but importantly, I don't have to deal with any changing anatomy. I know the anatomy is the same between those two. I've got a difference in contrast and resolution, and I've got some distortions which are present in one and not the other, but actually I've simplified the matter because actually all the folding patterns are the same. And the six degrees of freedom is easier to calculate than nonlinear as well. And so that registration is a lot easier to do than it would be to go from the EPI directly to the standard space. Then the second stage would be going from the T1 weighted structural of that individual to the standard space template. And again, 
the standard space template is the T1 weighted template. So that's the same modality, which is helpful. It means I don't have to deal with different differences in contrast. They both have good resolution. They both show the tissues very well. So that's helpful. However, the anatomy is different. And that's what the registration has to cope with. Because it's different anatomy, I need to use nonlinear registration. So that means typically an affine initialization followed by a nonlinear registration with FNERD. And then I can combine the two registrations together, the two transformations, and go to, from the EPI to the standard space. And I can do that with one resampling. We talked about combining uh, transformations and doing a single resampling in one of the other, other videos. And this is an instance where we do that. And so this is the way that we actually do registration within things like the functional analysis tool feed. And this is really helpful. We also should be doing the same things we talked about before, brain extraction. And we would run that on the T1 weighted image. Typically, it's already done on the standard space template. So we have a version of that which has already been brain extracted. We typically don't need to do it for the functional image because actually they use fat suppression so that there is very little non-brain um, signal uh, present in those images anyway. So it's typically that we only really need to run the brain extraction um, for the T1 weighted structure. And so if we look at how that um, is encoded in the, the tool, then you'll actually see in the, the feet, there's a registration tab, feet GUI, and within that, it shows you that there's part where you would specify the structural image, and so you have to tell it where that is, and the standard space image. You don't tell it about the fMRI because actually you've already told that on a different tab. You've, that's something that you put originally in the, uh, the data tab. But you would put these two in. So the fMRI it already knows about, it's implicit. And then these parameters are associated with the registration of that fMRI to this structural. And so here I've got six degrees of freedom as we were talking about before. And then we would go from the structural to the standard space and that would require a 12 degree of freedom initialization, an affine one, followed by a nonlinear, which we just got by ticking this box here. And there's a default warp resolution, which we talked about in another video. We can leave that the same if we're going to the standard MNI. And also notice that I'm using the underscore brain version. So I want to give it the brain extracted version here, and I want to give it the brain extracted version here. Actually, as a side note, the nonlinear registration is also going to use the non-brain extracted version so that it can cope with any errors that might have occurred in the brain extraction. We'll use that at a later stage of its processing. And so it assumes that in the same place that it can find structural underscore brain, there's also an image called structural, which is the non-brain extracted version. So whenever you put something in here, make sure that you give it the standard name. So you, you need a non-brain extracted image, which has got some name, and then you need that same name, underscore brain. That's how you should name the brain extracted image and put it in the same place. And so that's how this works. There's a first stage, which is just linear, and then a second stage, which is the affine initialization followed by the nonlinear. And that's how it appears in this GUI. The defaults are all good, so you can easily do it. But if for any reason you need to change those, that's where you would go to change them. And that's why it's laid out like this. And it's important to understand this too, because we'll see in the outputs that this is how it actually shows things. So just to sort of illustrate this visually. So here on the top line, we've got our three different images, the functional, the structural, and the MNI. In the second row, you can then see what's happened when we've actually applied all the transformations to get them into standard space. So this is actually the functional image in the standard space and the structural image in the standard space. And then the bottom row simply shows you the same thing with these same grayscale images from the middle row, but now overlaid with red images extracted from the standard space image. So again, that they should align nicely with the boundaries of the different tissues, which is easy to see in the structural, easy to see in many places within this functional, and it's actually more helpful than trying to say directly compare any of the images on the, the second row. So this kind of uh, 
display with the red edges and the grayscale can be really useful for evaluating performance. When you actually run Feet itself, you're going to get a web page output. And the web page output is going to look like this or something like this. It's going to summarize the overall transformation of all the way from the functional space into the standard space. Again, with the grayscale and the red edges, as we've seen. But it's quite useful to, rather than concentrate on that first, concentrate on these next two. This one shows you the functional to the structural registration in two different ways. So on the first row, we have the grayscale is the functional image, and then the red edges are extracted from the structural. On the second row, we have the grayscale is the structural image, and the red edges are extracted from the functional. You can see that the extraction of edges from the functional is not so good. It's not that easy to see lots of nice edges. It's easier to see the edges extracted from the structural, in this case, on top of the fMRI. But it will depend on the nature of your fMRI scans and your structural scans as to how well, how good they look. And so it's useful to have both of them. But they represent the same registration, just viewed two different ways around. This is also the same thing, but this is what you could see if you loaded it up into Fossilize, for instance. You can load in the edges and you can look at how they overlap. And this gives you, again, just a, a sort of stronger illustration of what things are like. Easier to see the red edges in the top row, which is extracted from the structural. In the bottom row, there are lots of sort of extraneous edges which come from this, you know, bits of non-brain material which are around. Again, we don't typically run brain extraction because there's very little non-brain material, but there is enough to generate some uh, edges which are distracting. Also another thing to point out is that this part of the top looks like it's registered really badly, but actually that's simply because this is CSF. This is bright CSF. This represents a subject which had some cortical atrophy, and so because of the brain atrophy there's a large pool of CSF on top. We're not interested in the boundary of the CSF. We're interested in the boundary of the brain, and so if we look at those boundaries, then we can actually see that we've got quite a good registration. So be alert for things like that as well when you're looking at these images. And then the next one that you'll see in the web page is the structural to the standard space registration or the MNI space. And then that again is shown in two different ways, with the grayscale being the structural and red lines, edges extracted from the MNI, and then the other way around. And so again, we can look at that, or we could load it up into fossilizing and we could look at it in more detail, um, zoomed in in different ways. So these are really useful things to look at because they're quite crucial in terms of telling you how well the registration looked. And then you can also look at the overall one of the functional all the way into the standard space. But you can see here, it's much harder to tell because we don't get so many nice edges extracted from the functional and many areas of the standard space also are quite blurry and don't uh, generate such nice edges. So it's actually harder to tell on the basis of this how good the registration is. It's enough to tell you if something has gone horribly wrong um, and that is definitely something that you should be alert to. But actually looking at the other two is more informative. And in any case that something does go wrong, it will have gone wrong in at least one of the other two cases. So either the functional to the standard, we, we call the functional example func and the, 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 um, the structural uh, high-res image. So either the functional to the structural, which is example func to high-res, or the structural to the standard, which is high-res to standard. One of those or both of those may have gone wrong if something is not right. So any failures you will detect in those and they need to be fixed in the individual ones. So you can't fix the overall one because it's just the combination of these other two parts. You need to fix one or both of the stages if they've both gone wrong and then it will recalculate the combination. And there's a little script that you can run called update feet reg and you can play about with different registration parameters and fix it yourself in certain circumstances where it might be challenging. Mainly, maybe because of artifacts or something um, difficult in that particular subject, such as pathologies. 
these are the kind of things where we may need to sort of intervene and do special kind of registration and then update it in this instance. So say we can't guarantee that it works 100% of the time, so you do need to be alert for these. It does work most of the time, so you don't end up doing this a lot, but you need to be checking your outputs and alert to it. So that's all I wanted to say about single stage and multi-stage applications. You've seen how they occur. There's some preliminary processing we always recommend to do first, reorienting, brain extraction, sometimes artifact creation such as bias fields if you can see an obvious artifact. And then the single stage for structural images, you can figure out what spatial transforms and cost functions are appropriate. Always visually check your results for, for any of these things. And then multi-stage is very commonly used in our big pipelines for combining these things together. And it benefits from each of the stages being simpler, there being fewer differences, uh, something that the registration can solve better. And then you would need to evaluate and look at the results for each of the stage, as well as the combined results. And if anything goes wrong, we need to fix one of the individual stages.